in our text today that comes to Jesus and says, good master, he'll speak about good. Did you read the passage I was preaching on today? Uh huh. Wait till you see this one. Yeah, the Holy Spirit. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Gonna be good. Gonna be good. Today is the day before Veterans Day. is a very important time in our country's history, and uh, I find it to be um, extra refreshing to be able to recognize men and women who are believers, servants of the Lord, the King of Kings, but also have served in our country. <clears throat> I'd like all of you to stand. Those of you who have served in the military or are currently serving, I want you to stay seated. And we are going to give you a standing ovation for your service unto the Lord. Thank you for serving the Lord and serving our country. Thank you. You look around and you see all those that are seated, and those are who we honor. Thank you for serving the Lord. It is an honor to serve the Lord with you in harmony and unity in the body of Christ, body of Christ. But thank you for giving, sacrificing, and uh, things that we'll never know that you have given up uh, for serving our country. And so thank you. Thank you, Lord, and thank you, men and women of the United States military. Uh, amen. Thank you, God. Back uh, just simply a month ago, I'll just say a month, but five weeks ago, uh, we uh, spent a little time around the Word in a special way. We had our Acts 1-8 conference the first weekend of October. We had, of course, Pastor Kevin Pesky come in, and we had some uh, really just, uh, to me, special minister, uh, missionaries tied to our church in an extra special way. Of course, Brian Clark we hadn't seen in a lot of years, only to go see him in London, uh, which could be in the future again. But uh, two missionary families, the Walkers and the Carters, are extra special to us. We have just deep relationship in a lot of ways tied together to people in this church. And of course, we just got back from Argentina. Two weeks from this Sunday, we're going to celebrate what God did and what he continues to do in Argentina and the mission work tied together to Cody and Millie Walker. We will extol the Lord together. And in that Acts 1-8 conference, when we spoke of extol the Lord, we realize that it means praise enthusiastically, praise highly, glorify, to proclaim the glory of. Yes, I got to get closer without my reading glasses. Don't come to the pulpit without your reading glasses. It's all good. But today um, is a follow-up from yesterday, Heather. Heather Carter spoke at our Daughters of the King luncheon yesterday. I uh, heard so many good things, wonderful things, godly things of her words, speaking of the work and speaking of God's work in her and in her and Lee and the, and the family and what God has continued to do in the Dominican Republic with the mission work that he's called them to do. Well, today, um, probably as an add-on more than anything, Lee, to Heather, but no, uh, we have our friend, missionary, Pastor Lee Carter, he's going to share just a few minutes of the work. We had him here preaching back in October in the investors crew and hanging out and had us set up out in the lobby talking with a lot of people. But today I wanted to make sure that you heard from his mouth a testimony, the testimony of the Lord to extol the Lord on what God continues to do and is doing in the Dominican Republic. Lee, come and speak to us. Thank you for being with us this morning. Enjoy. Have a good time. Extolling yeah, the Lord. Let's do it. Amen. And this time I'll remember the microphone. Okay, this is my beautiful bride. She is truly my better three-fourths. You know the old joke, men, we always say, I wear the pants in the family. I do. I wear the pants in the family, but she's the belt holding them up. Okay? So remember that. Um... I'm going to jump in real quick. Yes, this is about the Dominican, I promise. Romans 10, verse 1, starting there real quickly. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That's our desire for the Dominican Republic. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, 
but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And that biblically is the most accurate description I can find in the Bible of what's happening in the Dominican Republic and what they are like. They will use the phrase God constantly. So we have been, God specifically sent us to a portion of the Dominican Republic that's currently listed as the most dangerous place you can go in the country. And so you would think in a place like that, you would never hear the word of God unless it was being used in all the inappropriate ways. If I'm walking down the street, somebody, I, I'll pass them on the street and they will say, Dios te bendiga. It just automatically comes out of their mouth. They'll say, God bless you. When you purchase something in one of their stores, they will say, va con Dios, go with God. They will use his name constantly, every day, all over the place. But they do not know who he is. They do not have a personal relationship with him. For the, obviously, I'm speaking in general. Yes, there are saved people in the Dominican. But for the majority, they, they have no understanding personally of who Jesus Christ is and what his desires are for their life. And so it's critical. You guys are our first supporting church. You are the church that made the decision, hey, we've seen God in their life. We see this calling in their life. We're on board with this. And you've partnered with us from the get-go, even prior to us being called specifically to the Dominican. We had the blessing of serving here for two years um, in an incredible, amongst incredible men and women of God. And so you guys saw the need and you understand the biblical importance. You know, in John chapter 1, towards the end of the passage, you see John the Baptist point out this is the Lamb of God. And you see two of his disciples start following Jesus Christ. And, and that's what it's about. And in that process of starting to follow Christ, they ask that super spiritual question, you know, where do you live? He said, what are you, what are you looking for? And they said, where do you live? You know, it's spiritual growth. It shows where they were at. He met them where they were at. We want people in Valiente in the Dominican Republic, we want them to grow to the point that we can say there's Jesus and them identify him. Them know this is the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world, the Almighty One, and to be able to follow Him. And so, first of all, thank you for being on board. Thank you for your help, your prayers, your financial support. Thank you for everything you're doing with assisting with the ministry that God has in the Dominican Republic. And so, we have, in the last two years since we were here last time, we moved specifically to the area He wants us in. And began the process in the streets, preaching and teaching. God opened the door for us to be able to start gathering in a building, which is great. Because in the evenings, you're fighting heat, you're fighting darkness, and you're fighting mosquitoes. Okay? And so it's been a huge blessing. No rain issues or anything like that when you can gather in a building. So this is our logo. Congregarse, real quick. Congregarse means gather. Okay? We want people to gather and extol and worship and praise and give God the honor and glory. Crecer means grow. We want people to come and grow in their personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And discipular, we want them then to take what they're growing and learning and living and share it with others and assist them in the same process that they're going through. And so we put it right in our logo because one of the things in the Dominican where we're at, there's churches, there are churches where people gather, but they, you ask them, hey, why are you going there? What's the purpose of your church? And they have no idea. So we wanted to make it very clear to everybody in public why we're doing what we're doing. My beautiful bride and Johnny, Bethany, JJ, and Hosanna. And... Uh, so they're awesome. They're serving faithfully. They're, they're holding everything together while we're here. It's amazing the way God's using them. It's not just being maintained. It's continuing to grow. And uh, Johnny is my right-hand guy, and he was my friend first. 
So um, you can tell how much JJ loves pitchers. You know, very serious in that moment. And Hosanna's just holding on for dear life. So, and this is JJ in evidence. He's been corrupted. Okay. He, uh, we have a blast. He, man, he's my little buddy. And this is him welcoming his sister. He loves her to pieces. And I have 400 times more pictures of her than him. Uh, I am wrapped around her little finger already. That's my little Hosanna. I call her Jelly Bean. This is the island we live at, and we share it with Haiti. Haiti is a whole other world, not even close to being the same. Um, that's a whole other message. So, but that's the island. It's the Dominican Republic in Haiti. And then this is Valiente, divided into three sections. There's 35,000 people there. It was started about 15 to 20 years ago with squatters, brick by brick, building what they could build it for a home. They moved out of the capital because they couldn't afford to live in the capital, and they seized land that the government had not claimed yet, and now the government's just giving it to them. Um, we average, right now, last month, they averaged three and a half to four hours a day when it comes to power, electricity, and water comes in twice a week. It comes in on Wednesdays and Saturdays. You fill your tanks or your cisterns, and that's the water you use for everything but drinking. Um, you cannot drink the water. We divided the red area into 18 sections because that's where we're currently at and began to pray, saying, Lord, may we have a family in each section and begin the process. Um, that's what he'd laid out for us. So as we prayed, obviously, God is always faithful. And so in, within the last two years, which two years sounds like a long time, it's not. Um, within the last two years, those areas where you see the great big red blocks, we have begun working with a family or discipling a family or there's a family learning and growing in the Word of God. Amen. And so the ultimate goal is that within all 18, eventually on Thursdays, there will be a family in a neighborhood inviting others into their home to teach and share who Jesus is and begin the process of training them on how to study the Word of God. So that's currently what's taking place. That's fruit of your prayers. Water, rice, and health care. And that are the, those are the three things that God has given us and specifically told us to utilize for meeting people where they're at. So those bottles are about 75 cents in U.S. dollars it would be. Sounds like not very much. That's a lot of water for 75 cents. There are people there that cannot afford drinking water. And so what they do is they take the water that comes in weekly and they'll heat it up on the stove so that they can try and utilize it for drinking and other things. Uh, brushing their teeth, stuff like that. And so what we do is if you walk in the church, you come to us, you say, hey, I don't have water, we'll give it to you. we just give it to you for free. I'm going to carry it to your house, and I'm going to walk in the door, and I'm going to introduce the living water to the family while we're there. And so it's one of the ways that God allows us to start relationships within the community of people and start sharing who Jesus is with them. Rice is the staple in the Dominican Republic, if you're eating anything, there's rice added to it, which is why when we first moved there, I put on 30 pounds quickly. Um, but so it's a staple. They don't have food. They come in. We'll give them three pounds at a time. If it's a family, we'll send 10 pounds out the door if we need to of rice so that they have food. Medical care. My wife's a nurse practitioner. Everywhere Jesus went, he met people physically and spiritually where they were at. And so it's another process that God's using to meet people where they're at. And so she has begun four hours a week serving in a medical clinic in the community under another physician's license. Um, the lady is a Christian. She loves Jesus and was brought to tears when we walked in and said, hey, can we partner? And it was amazing what God's done there. So it's a picture of my wife serving in that clinic. Um, Saturdays, weekly is the way we're going to establish this in the mission house that we have right beside our church to begin the process of meeting people where they're at when it comes to this. She also, man, we're walking through the community. She sees somebody with an injury. She immediately starts caring for them because it's just part of who she is. And so it's something that God's using there. Dominoes, favorite game in the country. It's associated with alcohol and gambling. And so why not do it in the church, right? 
So, uh, yeah, that'll sink in in just a minute. Um, so, <laughs> so we said, let's do it with a clean environment. Well, let's see if we can target some men, because that's you see them playing it everywhere. And so we had a, this is a picture of our first one that we did, a tournament of dominoes at the church, clean environment. Halfway through, we share the gospel with all who have come. And this is the final table that, of the first tournament we did. And here's the medal winners. The first three guys on your left started faithfully coming to church because of a domino tournament, you know. And so the guy in the blue and white striped shirt was seen for three days wearing his medal all over town. And so he's very proud of it, which really shows you a lot about the culture. And uh, so it was pretty cool to be blessed with an idea like that from the Lord about how to meet some men where they're at. Baseball Academy, every Thursday we go, we share the Word of God, we begin the process of discipling these young men. Some of them we've had the blessing of pouring into for a couple of years now. And uh, when we show up, it's not me teaching and preaching every week, it's them. And so the goal and the concept and the vision with regarding this is let's penetrate MLB with some missionaries. Let's, as they're signed and sent into the teams themselves, they can take their relationship they have with Christ to that team and start introducing those players to who Jesus Christ is. So it's phenomenal what's happening there. That's a picture of John, by the way. He's the man from Haiti that's helping us. He had to leave Haiti because it's too dangerous. Um, had 13 years there, nobody had ever discipled him. Nobody had ever taught him anything about church planting. And he asked, he said, hey, can I come and join with you guys and learn and grow? And uh, has an extremely humble heart in, in the whole process. It's amazing. So this, whoop, our first uh, baptism certificates that we gave out. And, uh, and so there, that's two families represented there. The ladies are almost done with what we would call discipleship one and uh, growing like crazy on fire for Jesus. Ramona is ready to start the process with somebody else, the lady in the middle of the picture. Um, and then Claudia is, but she doesn't know she is. She's an uh, introvert, you might say. And so Heather's going to step into the next relationship with another lady and have her assist in the process and allow her to grow in her comfort with it. So... That's a picture of discipleship happening. And their kids are in the same type processes. This is movie night on the left. He's sharing his testimony of how Christ saved him. Um, we do a movie night every other Friday where we want families to come in and have a clean environment to be able to watch something, hang out together, have fun, but still grow. And so we, you know, we give them a pop and chips if they come. Because in Valiente, there's, there's nothing to do for the family. Um, what's offered is drugs, drinking, gambling, prostitution. And so we, we want, hey, you know, some of my fondest memories growing up was Friday night movie night at my house. My sisters would sit down with me. We would share a Coke. I remember that. We would eat popcorn with my family, have laughs, and just enjoy some time together that night. And so we've tried to, Heather had very similar things happen in her home. Um, and so we were just trying to pass on, man, you can just go hang out with a bunch of Christians and have fun too. So the guys on the right are also in discipleship and that's a picture of him going through the process of sharing his testimony. And, uh, Luis is sitting there on the right. He accepted Christ as crazy. I'll close with the story about Luis. It's pictures of the church saying, hi, I told him, tell everybody hi. This is a movie night picture. I'm at the beginning of it. So, Luis, uh, I was getting ready to meet with Justin that night for discipleship. Another man showed up at the church. We shared Christ with him. He wanted us to be able to communicate. He didn't have any phones. So, we're following this guy through the streets to go see where he lives because it's the only way I'm going to be able to follow up with him because I know where he lives. Luis is, uh, I've never seen him before in my life. Justin's in the front of the vehicle. I'm in the driver's seat, get ready to take off, back door opens up, Luis hops in, closes the door, puts his seatbelt on, I'm figuring Justin knows him, so away we go. We get about halfway to this guy's house, I say, hey man, introduce me to your friend. He says, Pastor Lee, I don't know him. 
so he don't know him, I don't know him. So at this point, I got some questions. And so, you know, I stop and I say, hey, you know, who are you? And uh, he introduces himself and says, I've been watching the church, been watching you guys. I was curious where you were going, what you were doing. Okay, so away we go. That's good enough for me. He's already in my car anyway, so, so away we go. And I say, hey, you're supposed to be sharing your testimony. Tell him about Jesus. He shares his testimony with Luis. Luis accepts Christ as his Savior in the back seat of my SUV. Amen. <laughs> Luis's mom and sisters are still in Haiti. He lives in the DR with his dad <clears throat> illegally. Um, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> I did it at the first service without crying. Um, Luis don't miss. That night, I was doing discipleship with Justin. Luis was like, I want to start. Luis don't miss. It's fruit laid to your account. Faithfulness of your prayers is manifesting itself in the Dominican Republic. Thank you for your faithfulness. Continue to pray for the people like Luis that are looking and searching and ready because we want to show them who Jesus is. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Good to hear the testimony of the Lord. We extol the Lord together on behalf of who he is and on behalf of what you guys are doing. So. Luke chapter number 18. Don't come to the pulpit without your reading glasses. I'll be right back. Last time we were in Luke, Make Hope Known in our series uh, was a few weeks ago, right after the Acts 1 8 conference. Thank you, Pastor Dwayne and Joshua, Pastor Josh and Brian for preaching and handling all those things that need to be handled as they always do. And taking care of responsibilities on Sundays while we were away. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, we will uh, speak about Argentina and the mission trip that we had there uh, two Sundays from this Sunday on the 24th of, of November. But we're going to get into the Word of God here. Last time, as I mentioned and started saying, we were in the beginning of Luke chapter number 18, looking at the first few verses, and, and the, uh, the thought process there was that little things uh, really important to God. They mean a lot. Uh, mean a lot to Jesus Christ. And the first verse, of course, or two, talk about uh, prayer and that the men ought always to pray and not to faint. And then Jesus Christ went and taught with parables again the principle of those simple things that are so important to the Lord Jesus Christ. And even ran, we ran into this contrast of the Pharisee the spiritual person, the religious person who says, this is the way I pray. I'm so glad that I'm not a sinner like such and such. And of course, then Jesus brings the focus down into this publican and how he is broken, that he is truly a repentant person in his prayer life. Well, now we're into Luke chapter 18, verse 15 down. We're going to go to verse number 30, and we're going to look at a passage of Scripture for time. We're going to move it along, and, and we've adjusted things. I wanted to make sure that Lee had the time that he needed, and it's worth every, every moment of just hearing the work of the Lord. But we're going to get into this passage of Scripture, um, looking at now an idea of how Jesus Christ and his teaching and his interaction, uh, first of all, with his disciples over some infants that come to him, and then his interaction with a man who's a ruler, who's a rich man, who says, good master, and he interacts with him. We're going to look at this as being a place of transparency. Transparency before the Lord is what we've entitled it. But I want you to consider that, of course, the Lord can see, can look in. The idea of the word transparency means that there is nothing blocking or in the way that it is a place where it's clear. And, and so the Lord can look into you. And so you, even though you and I might hide something, 
A lost person might hide something. The Lord can see our hearts, of course. But today we're coming from the place of transparency for us before the Lord. And as we look again at, hey, this idea of those simple things, those little things that mean a lot to the Lord, this transparency stuff I know really means an awful lot to the Lord. So let me do this. Let me just pray for a moment. And then we're going to read the scripture. And uh, we're going to go hard for the next few minutes. And I want you just to kind of consider what Jesus Christ is doing in his interaction with this rich man and how it applies to us today. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. It is still and it remains powerful, sharper, the two-edged sword. It continues to do the work that it must. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful for changing my life and changing all the lives of the believers here to your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just change, you made new. You gave us a new life, the Holy Spirit of God that we have within us. And so in our prayer this morning, as we open up the word, we've sung some, some tremendously powerful words of saying who you are and telling you about you, extolling you, Lord. We now come into your word and we want you to tell us something. Teach us something. Make us better. We want to be something different, something more when we leave our gathering over your word for the next 30-ish minutes. God, bless the work and the teaching by your spirit of your word. Make it personal in each one of our lives. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Follow along with me. Let's get into it. Chapter number 18, verse number 15, down through 30. Let's read our passage of scripture for study. And they brought unto him also infants, that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer, little children, to come unto me, and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. Oh, Luke, you know, Dr. Luke has taught and, and, and shown us through the Spirit of God's inspiration and, and all of his writings some extra special things, some one-offs, some parables, some teaching that don't maybe show up in Matthew and Mark, and especially, of course, not in John. But here we have a synoptic view of a setting where this occurs in Matthew 19 and Mark 10, and we know that it's got to be pretty important. Each one of the gospel writers have it there. And the view of it is, very simply, these children, these infants, are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's leave it right there for a minute. So many different people have come to Jesus. So many people come to him all the time in his ministry. He's getting near the end of his earthly ministry, and they're still coming. And of course, in that setting, we hear the, that the disciples kind of rebuked <laughs> the parents, for bringing their children, these little infants. Let's continue, verse number 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Great question. How does Jesus answer him? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. Now, did we happen to just sing about that? Stop it, Holy Spirit. Real quick, here's a pause. This is a little commercial. Psalm 34, 8. Come on, come on. Some of you are always thinking, I already know that one. I love that verse. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. I think that's pretty good. How about Psalm 25, verse number 8? You can just write them down in the column of your Bibles. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners. Hmm, there's some pretty good things right there. And we sung about that just a few moments ago. And then Lee spoke of how good the Lord has been. And here we have someone coming to Jesus and saying, good, master. And he says, why are you calling me good? Because there's only one that's good. And that's God. We'll sort this out here in a minute. Did he really see him as God, the son of God and the son of man? Or did he not? Why in the world? Because you would never call a rabbi, a master teacher, a religious leader good ever in that culture. Powerful little setting we have here. Verse number 20, we pick it up. 
Thou knowest the commandments, as he continues, Jesus teaching him, kind of schooling him in a way. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and mother. Did Jesus forget all the other commandments? No, but he is bringing up the commandments that have something to do with the interaction and the relationship piece of being obedient to God and how you deal with people. Yes? Did he happen to leave one out? Ah, Jesus is so good here. He doesn't have to say, okay, altar call just as I am. Jesus is going to use his own words that he wrote in order to get this man to a place where he is heavily convicted, so much so that he's very sorrowful. Verse number 21, he says, all these have I kept from my youth up. I've been a good boy. Verse number 22. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. He just went to the piercing part for personal conviction to this one person over covetousness. Jesus Christ has brought to bear the most important thing he could do in this setting, having that person understand their need. What's his reaction? What's his response? When he heard this, verse 23, he was very sorrowful, for he was rich. And we never have any any account, any witness of anything other than his response. It has been often said by those that are a whole lot more wise than I am, a lot wiser, it said this may be the one richest account in Scripture in Jesus Christ's ministry life where someone came to Jesus in a really bad state and walked away worse. He walked away worse. It can happen, can't it? It says in verse number 24, down through the end of the passage we're using in verse 30. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easy for a camel to go through a needle's eye than a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, who then can be saved? Jesus, does it mean it is impossible to be saved? And he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. When it comes to salvation, there's nothing that man can do to save himself. Nothing that religion can do to save anyone. It is impossible with men for salvation. But here we have Jesus Christ saying it's only possible with God. Of course, a self declaration that he is the Son of God and the Son of Man. Verse 28, old Pete comes into the thing. This is really cool. A great little interaction here and, and a great statement. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. That is going to be a great ending in a few minutes on this passage of Scripture. Just think, just think of what Jesus Christ is saying in such a weighty matter. If you give your life to me and you live in this spirit-filled life in the kingdom of God, whoa, the manifold more. We'll get into that again at the end. But here's a little bit of an introduction and some things for you to think about. When we are exposed to humility, it is often the glaring contrast of pride that makes the lesson so profound. There is such a picture of humility on one side and a picture of not so much on the other. It can be said that the part of Christ, that part of Christ's success in teaching, just a part of the way he was successful in teaching the disciples involved his personal character. At the root of his character was the essence of humility. Jesus Christ taught from that place of humility. And yet, he sees this beautiful setting of the children and the infants, and they show humility, but this rich person, not so much. You see, again, as it says up on the screen in this artwork, I preached a series maybe eight, nine, ten years ago. It is the root of all. I would say, and I would agree with what Andrew Murray has said about 
Jesus Christ and his humility and his character, that if Jesus Christ is indeed to be our example in lowliness, we need to understand the principles in which humility was rooted. It was rooted in him emptying himself of he being God to come to this earth. It is centered up in Philippians 2, and, and you understand that whole idea. It is the root of all, and it has something to do to me with the success of the teacher, Jesus, the God-man, the man-God, Jesus Christ. And so we see this humility found, and then we see the absence of humility on the other side. You see, what can we say about little children when all they want is acceptance and love? You see that little baby, Hosanna, that's all she wants to do. Grandpa wants to steal her away from Mama. But all she can do is depend upon those that are caring for her. Is not the character of a little child the embodiment of how we are to come to the Lord Jesus Christ? We should approach the Lord with childlike humility and honesty. That little baby on your lap, Sanchez's, unless Grandma stole her. She cannot protect herself. She cannot provide for herself. She's counting on someone in the adult universe to care for her. These infants, these children, come to Jesus because they want to be cared for. Consider that's the way that we are supposed to be before God. We get all full of ourselves sometimes and we think, oh gosh, I'm just growing in the Lord. I got the five, six, seven, eight, twelve steps of stages of growth and discipleship. And that's your relationship with the Father in heaven is continually being reminded to you. You are reminded constantly you're called a child, you're called a son, you're called a babe. Yes, you're supposed to grow spiritually. Yes, you're supposed to, but please, please don't get to a place where when you go before the Father, you say, Oh, I'm so glad that I'm not like that poor publican who hasn't grown to the greatness that I have, holy God. But I'm thankful that you will hear my words. There are people like that that I know that approach God like as if, yeah, I've matured, I've grown to that place. Oh, God, forgive us for not having that childlike humility and honesty. I'm not talking about being a childish baby that wants their way. I'm talking about that childlike approach, heart, attitude before the Father of God. Similarly, the unbelieving soul, troubled by this world's grip of sin, should come to the Lord in the same manner, completely transparent and in desperate need of salvation. The guy that jumped in your van, your vehicle child i hear you're doing something and i want to find out about it where are those people in your life and the public is standing afar off as i mentioned earlier would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven but smote upon his breast saying god be merciful to me the transparency before jesus christ that's what we're going to talk about for just a few minutes consider this incredible spot for this rich man and for these little infants. You see, this is another lesson on riches that, the, that Luke recorded. But the context, context here is instruction on wealth as it pertains to enter, entering into salvation in the kingdom. This is a comment on the commentary of Dr. Constable. Someone might conclude from the previous incident that salvation depends upon the proper human attitude. This teaching right here in this spot here clarifies that while the correct attitude is crucial, salvation is the work of God for man, not man's work for himself. This is important revelation for unbelievers, but also for disciples charge. You disciples are charged with the bearing of the gospel message to the ends of the earth right now, as much as they were 2,000 years ago. You see, this is transparency before the Lord. This rich man was on trial before Jesus. And so let's grab some things from him. Again, we're going to move quickly for time, but this is designed in that way. Spirit of God, we want him just to work through all of this. I want you to see these simple little lesson points that go along with our passage. First one, being transparent with Jesus. Why are people not meek and childlike before the Lord about their need for him alone? Why? Just stop and think, why? Why are we, why are people not meek, childlike before the Lord 
about their need for him alone. It says in verse number 17, Jesus' words, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. You come to the Lord and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. There is none righteous, no, not one. I am a child in need of salvation through your son, Jesus Christ, the ministry of reconciliation. For by grace are ye saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When you come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, you enter into the kingdom of God. You now are part of what Jesus Christ is saying is, my kingdom, I'm the ruler. It's the spiritual kingdom. To be transparent before the God, before Jesus Christ, before the Lord God Almighty. Hey, people, why are you not? Why are we not? Why are there people not meek and childlike before the Lord about their need for him alone? Because they're living a physical life. They think everything is a t- uh, uh, tied together to a physical thing. It's a spiritual life. Children, they are in a place, again, where they can't do anything for themselves. They are dependent. And that's the picture of these first few verses that tie together to this whole passage, I believe. Instead of them being tied together to the first 14 verses, I believe and see that they study out to tie together just before Jesus does this incredible prosecution or at least righteous judge action with this rich man. It says in Romans chapter number 8, since we've been studying it a little bit in the Argentina trip, and I thought, there's a lot of cool stuff here. Let's tie it together because it's right on the money. Verses one, number 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. When you get saved, there's no more any condemnation. You are born again. You're in the Spirit of God. You are in Jesus Christ. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's this child right here. That's this person that says, hey, I am meek. I am childlike. And I'm coming to you transparent because I would love to live in your kingdom. I want eternal life. I want to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. For what the law could not do, it that in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That is the childlike faith that you exhibited the day that you got saved, and that is the childlike approach that you're supposed to have, and I'm supposed to have to the Father. That's the approach that the lost people, the unbeliever, is supposed to say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I need you to save my soul. The second thing about being transparent with Jesus Christ, found in verses 18 through 23. Why are people not open and forthright before the Lord about their riches in this world? Jesus Christ says, in verse number 22, now when Jesus had heard these things, he said unto him, you lack one thing. Sell all that thou hast, distribute unto the poor. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. Everything that has to do with your physical being that you think has the blessing of God to salvation is not so by Scripture and by the Son of Man and the Son of God himself. Some of us really still think, because part of the Jewish culture was that if you brought your kids to the religious person that Jesus, of course, would bless them. The rabbi would bless them. Well, what about the rich man? He comes to Jesus and he's saying, hey, I'm rich. I've been blessed by God. I must have a great life. I'm a godly, religious, goodly person. And Jesus undoes that completely. Why are people not open and forthright before the Lord about the riches in this world? Because the treasures in heaven ought to be more important to us, should they not? But we love the riches. Maybe too much. Maybe too much. Maybe the lost person. You see, as an unbeliever for a lot of years, I... I love the idea of doing everything myself, even though I would give God a little tip. You know how we are. 
We want the riches of this world, and we want God to bless it in a way. So it's kind of like a after the fact, oh, thank you, God, you're so cool. I'll give you props. The man upstairs, you're so good to me. This rich man says, good master, and Jesus undoes the idea of good. Which way do you want it? Do you see him as good? Do you see him as master? Do you see him good being because that's God? Or do you see him as just being a good master teacher? He's completely convicted and uh, uh, conflicted and convicted, and he walks away from this place realizing that, hey, I'm not doing treasures in heaven. Uh Uh-uh. I'm doing treasures right here. And I'm concerned that maybe... Followers, disciples, or just believers in Jesus Christ live in that place as well. The word inherit the kingdom of God, inherit the eternal life, has so much to do with the idea of receiving something, to be part of an inheritance, to be a partaker of Jesus Christ as a joint heir and what the Father bestows. Consider this in that carnal life versus the spiritual life, this eternal life thinking, the treasures in heaven, the kingdom of God thinking versus the kingdom of this world. Think of Romans chapter number eight up on the screen, verses five through eight. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. This is the conflict of the rich man. This is the conflict of so many people that will not come and be open and forthright to the Lord about their riches in this world. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You live a carnal life, you will die a short life. I promise you that. You think that's a spiritual life so then you can lose your salvation. That's not what it's saying. You live a carnal life, I promise you one thing. Your life will not be as pleasant as if you live a more spiritual life. Paul's wrestling everybody in that church letter about that and letting them know if you live after the flesh, you will get a life after the flesh. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. A born-again Christian who loves Jesus Christ and got saved cannot please God when they live in the carnal mind. I've tried it. I don't know about you. Maybe you've been successful. I have tried it. It don't go that way. Pleasing God is the spirit life in the kingdom of God. Treasures in heaven, that's what it is. The rich man couldn't get a handle on that. Now think of the lost person that you know that wants to do life that way. It wants to wake up at 75 years old and say, hey, I did all that I had to do. Now maybe I can have an opportunity to make things right with God and the man upstairs. Oh, watch out. We know that this has been taught before. Your soul may be required of you one day. Third one, being transparent with Jesus Christ. Why are people not sad and convicted before the Lord about their ignorance of salvation? Now let's get into the unbeliever for just two or three minutes here. Why are people not sad and convicted before the Lord about their ignorance of salvation? There's a lot of people like this rich man that does to be saved? What do you mean by being saved? What are you going to do, throw a life preserver when I'm in the water because I'm going to be drowning? Is that how you're going to save me? What are you going to save me for myself? I've heard that phraseology as well as anything else I've heard from a lost person pushing back on me and saying, what do you, what do you here do? Save me? Save my soul? I've heard it from people that are a whole lot more successful than any person that I have met in this church. People that have made millions and millions. What are you here for? To save save me? You see, they're ignorant of salvation, but they don't understand. All things are possible with God, it says in Scripture. In fact, let's just clean up what it really says. It doesn't say all things. It says right here. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, How hardly shall they that have riches enter the kingdom of God because you believe that the riches are the thing that's going to be fulfilling to look before God and say, look at God, I'm so blessed. Easier for a camel to go through the needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Then who can be saved? The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Man looks around and says, wow, look at me, I'm a rich person. Obviously, I conclude that I'm better than everyone else. God's blessed me more than anybody else. I'm a self-made person. I'm secure in myself. I have self-preservation. Watch out, lost person. 
Why are people not sad and convicted before the Lord about their ignorance of salvation? Because they really think they can save themselves. And don't forget, these rich people also conclude, because they're rich, nothing can get them. They're secure. They're good. They lived a wonderful life. Romans chapter number 8, verses 9 through 11 say this, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Believer, believer, right? Speaking of a believer. But let's look at the lost person now. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. There's the difference. I wonder if someone's saved or lost. It's in the Scriptures. Verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of the sin, but the Spirit of life is because of righteousness. Oh, yeah, life, new life, kingdom of God, life eternal, everlasting. It begins at the moment of your salvation. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Ooh, ooh, this is good. We get in right there, we got one more to go. That's good. That's the truth of what Jesus Christ is teaching the rich man. So Paul taught the same thing to the church? Well, I think that's probably a good idea. Jesus teaches it, we grab it, and we teach it again. That's a good way for discipleship. That's a good way to reproduce the things of God. Here's our last one about being transparent with Jesus. Being transparent with Jesus, verses 28 through 30. Why are people not willing and receptive before the Lord about their lack of a meaningful life? I told you it would be a good, good conclusion here. Maybe some of you have sat here in the preaching and teaching of the word over the years, or maybe in your own quiet time, or maybe in a one-on-one -on -one discipleship setting, maybe in a small group, maybe in a Bible study, maybe in an institute, and you're wondering, how is it that Job went through what he went through? How is it that Paul went through what he went through? How is it that all these people, every single person I know that gives their lives for Christ and serves them, they suffer an awful lot? I don't know, do they? Let me read the scriptures. Whew. Let me reread this passage and read Romans chapter number 8. Then Peter said, lo, we have left all and followed thee. Because he was around when Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. He was around. Don't forget he got a little bit mixed up with the denial thing. Oh, oh. Jesus got him though, didn't he? On the shore with the fishes. Do you love me? But here's Jesus' response. I repeat, reading the word of God. Verily I say unto you, there is no man that had left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come life after life. You and I can't measure the manifold more how many times has God protected your husband when he left the home? How many times did God take care of you, Stacy, as a little girl in Africa? The manifold more. How much did God do for us in Argentina? And these are small things. How much manifold more in this life in Jesus Christ right now goes on that you and I just go, oh, I'm, I'm just suffering. He says, you receive manifold more in this and in life eternal. Why are people not willing and receptive before the Lord to realize they have a meaning, a lack of a meaningful life? You don't do a whole lot for Jesus Christ, you... I would just encourage you to realize that you need to stop listening to everyone else tell you what it's worth, that it's worth it all. You need to stop just living off of everybody else's testimony. Why don't you just go have a testimony of the Lord yourself? Because it's not your testimony anyway, it's his. 
so you can extol the Lord, so that he can work in you both the willing to do of his good pleasure, and it will be something you just cannot measure. I have not seen nor ear heard or entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them to love him. That's for that church at that moment in 1 Corinthians. It's also for eternally and that everlasting life. Romans 8, I read this and I finish with an invitation. It says in verse number 12, let's just read it. I'm just going to read it. I'm not going to stop, just, just, just follow it. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. But if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. What a vibrant life in the Holy Spirit, even in the suffering, even in the heartache, even in the pain. The two or three, four hours of prayer on your face, crying out to God, is so much better when you mortify the deeds of the body. And you exalt the name of the Lord. For as many as are led of the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if the children of God, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Yes. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I know we always push that off, but let me just say, when God does something incredible in your life, it's his glory shining in your life. And people see it in you and they go, what happened? God did something through and despite me. That's his glory in us, in Jesus. What Jesus Christ wanted for the audience of lost people was the clear understanding that this life is great, but eternal life, it's greater. Would you today, all of us, believer, unbeliever, would you be transparent with the Lord Jesus Christ today about your life? Why don't you stand with me? Debbie, go ahead and start our invitation. I'm going to pray real quick, and then you can respond as the God, as the Lord would have you to do. Would you be transparent with the Lord Jesus Christ today about your life? Lord God in heaven, this is your time, and you've allowed us to be in on your time. This is kingdom of God, body of Christ In the name of Jesus' time, thank you, Holy Father. We come to you as children, as infants, and we are really, really needy. I'm just telling you, transparent, I'm so needy of you. I need you so much. I pray for this church. I pray for the people of First Bible. God, make this a precious time of prayer, a place of transparency before you. Bless this time of prayer and invitation in Jesus' name. As the music plays, would you come? Would you take the time to come pray, to be transparent with the Lord Jesus Christ? I know you can do it right there. Why don't you come up here? It's a safe place. Be transparent with your life. Have you figured out that you will Receive manifold more in this present time. What a life in Christ that you and I can have. There's so much more here. Come, take the time to pray. We'll tarry just for a moment. Please, come.